Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here on our third and final day or fourth and final day of the National Bike Summit. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us for our special edition of our uh, Bicycle Friendly University uh, Professional Development and Networking uh, Day, which is hybrid. We've got a few people in person in Washington, D.C., and a bunch of you online um, all across the country. Um, and we've got two great sessions today. This is the first one, Abandoned Bike Abatement, The Good, the Why, the Lessons Learned, and How to Avoid It Entirely. And before I hand things over, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Amelia Neptune. I'm the director of the Bicycle Friendly America program, which includes the community program, the business program, and the university program. And I always, I, I think a lot of you on the call already know this about me, but I, I like to um, share this background that the BFU program is so near and dear to my heart because um, before I worked at the league, I was the campus bicycle coordinator at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, but I didn't start out that way. I started out as the um, sustainability specialist for facilities and services. And right before I was hired there in 2011, the U of I got a bronze BFU certification and they got this big feedback report from the league. And uh, they uh, handed it to me as a new employee and said, here, implement some of this feedback. And I was able to use that feedback to make the case to change my job into um, focused entirely on biking. Um, so the BFU program sort of helped shift my career towards biking. And um, now I like to see those kinds of transformational changes happen on campuses um, uh, all across the country. And, and I've been in the shoes that a lot of you wear, um, working really hard to improve your campuses. So I know that this topic of abandoned bikes uh, is a really big one for campuses. Um, and it's something that people outside of the university sphere don't always understand how important this is to all of you. So thanks for being here. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes. We are recording this session and we will post it in Whova and on YouTube later on. Um, attendees are muted, so please type any questions you have into the Zoom chat. And um, later we'll let everybody unmute and have a discussion. Closed captions are available and they should be on already for you. You can hide them, um, turn them on or off for yourself. Um, and please feel free to put your um, name, pronouns, and what school you're from or community you're from uh, in your Zoom name box uh, so everybody can see sort of where everybody else is from. Um, and join us uh, online on social media with hashtag Bike Summit 23. All right, so now I'm very happy to introduce our wonderful speakers today. Huge thank you to all three of these folks um, from uh, some awesome bicycle from the universities. We'll hear from uh, Jeff at UC Davis and then Ariadne from Stanford and finally Nick from Virginia Tech. Um, so I will, uh, without further ado, hand it over to them, um, starting with Jeff at UC Davis. So take it away, Jeff. Let me stop screen sharing so you can um, take over. Thank you, Amelia. So great to be in this space with everyone. Um, you know, I do uh, always love to kind of co connect with the bicycle community that we have. I'm happy to actually be here in DC. Um, so I've been meeting a lot of the awesome folks who've come here, met a couple other BFUs already, um, and wish there were more of you here, but I'm not here to recruit you to travel. So I'll just go ahead and jump into this. Um, I hope the presentation is displayed fully now. Yep, perfect. Awesome. All right, so um, I kind of want to just like start off with a quick uh, introduction to my program. So um, we're fairly lean department. So I work as one of one and a half people. My supervisor gives a little bit of his time to oversee it, but we're largely dependent upon students to run most of all of the programming I'm going to talk about today. So the registration program is a really important part of it. I kind of want to share that about how to avoid impounding bikes, um, but really kind of the nitty gritty of how we do what we're up to um, and hope to share some of the tips about like how we've got it, at, how we're doing it these days and always kind of looking on continuous improvement. And that's what something I love talking with our campus colleagues on. Um, so uh, just kind of high level, we collect GPS records on every bike um, that we impound, every bike we tag, uh, we do. So this is a kind of heat map showing year to year over year where we've been doing different bikes. Um, I, I kind of would love to dig into this, but I'm not gonna get into it. If we have questions later, I'll pull this slide back up. Um, but you know, this is an important part of helping folks understand why we're doing this. So um, we have a couple different kind of methods when we um, are handling abandoned bikes or, you know, bikes that are parked improperly or bikes that are in areas that we need to deal with them. So if it's an abandoned bike, we tag it, we wait a little while, we go back, and then we impound it. Um, we do this in general areas, kind of focusing on, you know, making sure that our high occupancy rack, our, our high demand rack areas 
have, have availability. Um, we do it every summer in the housing areas so that we can ensure that there's space for our incoming students to park their bikes. Um, fun fact, we have a standard on our campus that it, there's to be 1.3 bike racks per pillow. Um, that's how we measure it to assure that we have ample parking for the many students who come here with a bike. And we assume some people like myself may have more than one bike. Um, and then we do it on request. So if people ask us, hey, there's a problem here, we'll go out and address it. Um, but we do it in the whole area. We never impound just one bike someone's complaining about. We have to go through the whole area kind of democratically um, as to not be, you know, just not to go impound the one bike someone's got a grump, grumpy attitude on. Um, we do coordinate with construction projects. That's kind of a, when we can, we tag it, we wait a little while, we come back. I put wait and return in brackets because our construction team's not always uh, nice to us and shares the necessary timeline. We have a 72 hour notice policy on our campus and trying to get our parking code. Um, if we don't get that, we force that construction project to replace the people's broken locks if we can return the bike. Um, that's a really important policy that we've gotten in through uh, kind of our standards, practices, and businesses. Um, but it, because we're destroying people's personal property when we impound their bike, um, I felt like this was a really important thing that we didn't have precedent on until I joined the campus a couple of years ago. I've been on the role for about three and a half years. Um, and then taking care of people, um, you know, behaving badly. Uh, I have kind of a, a hodgepodge of photos here of people locking their bikes to trees, a scooter locked through someone else's bike, um, kind of a couple examples of bikes on handrails and kind of a classic sun faded rusted bike. I know that photos are small, but you know, campuses are kind of a wild and chaotic environment. Um, we do have to impound bikes unnecessarily sometimes, um, but it's necessary because it's blocking ADA access or it's a fire violation. Um, this is how we try to avoid it. We have a robust registration program. Um, we adopted Bike Index in fall of 2021. Um, we replaced our historic California bike license system that was managed locally in-house um, in favor of the universal system that is Bike Index. Um, benefits to this is the bike can be registered no matter where it goes versus the old system. If it was recovered anywhere outside of Davis, no one had any chance of knowing that that bike belongs to someone at UC Davis, except if they had like a UC Davis sticker or something on it. It just said California bike license and the six digit number. Um, in my research of calling the DMV, they're like, no, we're the Department of Motor Vehicles, not bicycles. Go to your bike shop. And I'm like, no, no, but I'm, it, it ain't. Um, we do charge for this on our campus. Um, we're an auxiliary unit. Um, so in order to put bike racks on campus to pave our bike paths to do any of that, this $12 fee is a little bit of fee that we collect to do that. Uh, we largely do that via parking revenue, but I'm not the parking guy, I'm the bike guy. Um, important thing though, is it gives us an ability to identify bikes back to people. So if we, when we can, we can return the bike. Um, this is enshrined in our code. Um, we don't enforce the mandate. Um, I think that's kind of an important thing to note. You know, we're not trying to catch people, but we do want to make sure we rightfully know whose bike it is when we return it. Um, so this is the magic of kind of how we do it. I, I built a kind of tracking thing inside of Survey123. That's a product from Esri and the ArcGIS kind of portfolio of services. Um, but the important thing that we do here is we capture a photo of the bike when we see it first. Um, this gives us a before and after condition. We assign a unique ID to every bike when we first see it so that we can always track this throughout our system. My students, when I joined, used to just make up a random three-digit number. There were a lot of bike one, two, threes. Um, and so when I was like, why do we have eight bike one, two, threes? They were like, because we just make up three-digit numbers. I was like, alphanumeric. We're going to go alphanumeric. And I think we're at E600 right now. Um, so we've been through roughly five or 6,000 tags since we began that. Um, and again, the bikes sit for at least 72 hours, and then we come back and then we cut the lock. Um, we capture basic info at the start of it. Um, so that's the make, model, color, any licensing information, and the basic information of how complete is the bike. Going back to that first photo, this is important because sometimes bikes will lose, lose their wheel after we tag it. So then we can kind of have that. If the photos change, we update the photo. Um, we say, did we impound it? Yes or no, or not yet. Um, the no is something that I'll kind of come back to later. Um, uh, and then when we impound it, we take a photo of it at its moment of impound. We take photos of it when it is pulled into our, into our storage areas. We use those photos for auctions later. Um, that's my next slide. Um, 
but the kind of important part here is it's a clean finished process at this point we've cut the lock we flipped the bike we got its serial number and it goes into our storage and it sits for 90 days um we do really really try to get bikes back to people um you know the registration program with bike index is is a is ha, has been kind of a wild success so far um it's it's allowed folks to get their bikes registered kind of on their own time um, and we're actually getting a lot of bikes that are registered on bike index not registered through our program but because they took the time to register their bike on bike index i can return that bike to them later and that's when i sell them the registration charge so it's a really low fee for impound release it's 10 bucks we want people to get their bikes back um if the bike was reported stolen it's a free release it goes to the police they release it um that's to kind of encourage people to address the bike theft problem that we have on our campus and then we do sell them on auction so we have roughly monthly auctions i think we skip december because it doesn't really work that well um but yeah we have monthly monthly auctions where we put somewhere between 150 to 200 bikes up um we've made roughly about thirty thousand dollars i think it's 27 and like 686 or something exactly um since we started this a little over a year ago um and the kind of cool part about this is this is in following california law any bike not sold at auction we're then free to do what we want um so we donate them to students um, who are identified by our basic needs center um, those bikes are repaired through some local partnerships that we have. Um, we donate them to various groups. Um, you know, we're really trying to not throw bikes away. And I'm proud to say since I joined the program where they formerly created, I think, 10 tons of bike trash per year um, outside of my first month where they forced me to put bikes in dumpsters, I've never thrown a bike away. Um, and we're moving through bikes at a pretty rampant rate. Um, and this is just to kind of give context. Uh, we have 34,000 bike racks on our campus, and while that sounds like ample, uh, we do have roughly 22,000 bicyclists on our campus every day. We uh, have an estimated 30% mode share for bicycling. Yes, that's high. Davis has some magic things going on. I can't take credit for it. That's the campus I started on in 2019 or so, uh, but I'm really privileged to kind of share all this information. I look forward to um, ask a Q&A later, and then I think from here I'll only promote the we this group a lot of us university folks do get together so if you'd like to talk more we do it on thursdays and kind of afternoon time for east coasters lunch time for us west coasters if you're interested in this shoot me a message put your email in the chat we love talking with university folks we do try to keep this to university folks exclusively though so that we kind of have a private space to talk about these things um from there i'm done i'll stop my share and let Rodney go so um we can move on to the best part chat Okay, that was amazing, Jeff. I think I stayed on time, so I'm like kind of happy about it. Yeah, well done. <laughs> so I think you can all see my screen now. So um, happy to be here. Um, I. My title is the Assistant Director of Active Mobility at Stanford. This June, I will be here 15 years, which is amazing. I was just commenting to Amelia, I remember that very first bike summit. Um, so a lot of history here. We're proud that we are a platinum level uh, bicycle friendly university and the first one to be designated. And we don't want to rest on our laurels. Uh, we want to continue to scale up and we're here to help in any way with all the universities um, in the United States to mentor and share best practices. So um, I've been working um, at Stanford for 15 years. Prior to that, I worked for specialized in the bicycle industry. I also managed a, a grant for the California Office of Traffic Safety on injury prevention. And um, I'm also on the board of the People for Bikes Foundation, who, whose mission is to get uh, more people riding every day and making bike riding uh, better for everyone. So um, just a few uh, snippets on this slide. We just published our, our new bike study, which I'll include the link on the last slide. You can reference it. It covers uh, sort of the state of where we are at Stanford, our new mobile concierge bike, uh, uh, a dual event bike uh, that we take all over to share best practices. And then on the bottom, um, we have two of our students who were fortunate they do wear a helmet because we have a challenge getting more students to wear helmets um, on campus. 
Um, whoops, next slide. Oh, this isn't going. Hold on, let me try again. Why isn't this going? Okay, um, we've been spinning our wheels on the campus since 1891. This is at Encina Hall. Um, we have a long history of people using uh, active mobility to get around the campus. 22% of our university commuters ride bikes. 85% of our new students own bikes. We have over 13,000 bike racks on the campus. Um, over 13,000 bikes on the campus on a daily basis and over 20,000 uh, bike racks on the campus. Um, and we're adding bike racks uh, annually as well. So unlike Jeff's program that is so detailed and well organized, our challenge to date with our program is dealing with abandoned bikes on campus. We do not uh, manage the program individually. We, um, the program is managed by our Stanford University Public Safety Department. And then we collaborate with our campus planning and design team and also our project management team that builds everything new on the campus and also our diversity and access office on giving guidance for public safety to manage the program. So we are in Santa Clara County and we have to follow um, the protocol for seizing bikes um, that's under our county regulations. So the bikes are tagged for a 14 day notice removal. removal. They're held for 90 days as seized personal property. And then to date, uh, over the last four years, we had over 3,000 abandoned bikes removed, almost 500 unclaimed abandoned bikes sold. And then the bikes that aren't claimed, um, they're sold for $30 to Stanford affiliates and or donated to charity. And the big challenge in the past three to four years was the impact of COVID on our campus and the number of bikes that were abandoned. As soon as COVID hit, students just left and they left their bikes behind. They left them parked uh, on the main campus in the quad and then they just stayed there. And it presented so many challenges because everyone knew um, that the students were gone um, and that public safety, they were so busy with managing other challenges of COVID, patrolling wasn't as strong. And as a result, there was a lot of tampering. There was a lot of bike parts being stolen, saddles being stolen, bikes being stolen. So it presented qu quite a bit of challenge uh, for public safety and for the campus in maintaining, you know, the environment that we want um, to project in our neighborhood. So we collaborated with our campus partners to uh, make it easy to identify the location of where all the bikes were and report it to public safety uh, for uh, abatement. In front on the left is sort of in front of the main quad of Stanford and these bikes were left completely there as soon as COVID hit and they remain there for you know almost six months. And then we've just, been continuing to update the key areas and identify where the bikes are so that public safety can come in and do, the, and do their job. The one good outcome is this, um, the bikes that are recycled, um, they um, are given to the Stanford Bicycle Project. And this uh, student group was founded in 2015. Um, it's a registered community service organization at Stanford. They focus on promoting bicycle safety, sustainability, and self-reliance. And they donated 100 bikes to first-generation low-income students on campus. And then they also host free bike repair classes for all students too. So over the past year, they donated over 100 bikes and they estimated over $45,000 estimated saved by students. So it's a wonderful organization. Um, you know, it just sort of promotes the reuse, reuse, recycle um, when applying to bikes as well. And then I just listed my contact information. Please reach out if you have any questions. As I mentioned, we are so happy to share 
any of our efforts in the five E categories that the league has established. Um, we have a, a very robust um, new program update I put in the link that talks about how we lead the way in, in national bike programs. And then I listed our website at two. So the, the one good thing about bicycle people is they love to share information. And I encourage you to join the chat um, that Jeffrey uh, convenes on Thursdays because we learn so much from each other. And I think that's the beauty of our program that we, we share and we don't hoard our information. We want everyone to be, um, you know, platinum. We want to help you improve. So count on us to help in any and every way. And I'm going to stop sharing and I will let Nick take over. Right. And while Nick's getting that up and running, I'll just uh, reiterate that we'll post all the um, presentations in Hula afterwards. So if you want to check out those links easily, um, you'll have access to all of these afterwards. Go ahead. Great. Um, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm Nick Quint, uh, Transportation Network, Network Manager at Virginia Tech, um, and uh, where I also um, oversee all our TDM programs. Um, a little bit about the university. We're a silver level uh, bicycle friendly university. Um, we have around 37,000 students. Um, a little over 10,000 of those are um, on campus. Uh, total bike rack capacity is just over 5,300 bikes. Um, we, uh, in terms of our uh, sort of bike uh, parking spaces to individuals ratio. It's about one um, space to every 8.5 individuals. Um, in the last four years, we've registered around 4,000 bikes. Uh, and prior to the pandemic, we were averaging about 240 bikes, um, uh, impounding 240 bikes uh, per year. Um, and uh, that's good. That, that number was something that we wanted to um, reduce. So uh, about two years ago, we kind of put our heads together to, to see um, what we could do to um, increase efficiencies and, and, and get that number down. And um, we came up with a, a four-part strategy, um, the first of which was, was really focusing on getting people to register their bikes. Um, and when I arrived at Virginia Tech four years ago, uh, the, a lot of the um, sort of the benefits of registering a bike were, were around um, theft prevention and um, recovering stolen bicycles. Um, fortunately, in, in Blacksburg, that's not really a huge issue. Um, but what is a big issue is we have a lot of construction uh, going on. There's there's always bike racks getting moved, and we have no way of communicating with with um, bicycle owners uh, if their bikes aren't registered, and so. Um, we make sure to, to push this at, at all of our events um, during move-ins. Um, uh, bike registration is, is free for everyone, um, and it's handled through uh, uh, our T2 uh, Flex system that, that is set up for parking permits. Um, the second thing we did was, in, in addition to, to um, like notices that get posted through campus newsletters, um, and social media and, and kind of some of our other um, outlets. We, we uh, worked with housing to send emails directly to students, um, notifying them that, you know, hey, you can't leave your, your bike on campus over the summer. Um, uh, and, you know, here's, if, if, if you maybe aren't um, interested in, in owning a bike anymore, here's, here's ways you can donate that to um, get it in the hands of of others who um, are interested, um, uh, and so this is this has been really successful. We we've um, we start this usually four weeks before commencement, um, and we'll send a couple of follow up emails. Um, a, a big thing that's helped from an efficiency standpoint is we we switch from a, a system of tagging bikes um, to signing racks, like you see in the in the image here. Um, so when, when we tag bikes, we would, uh, wait a couple weeks and come back through any bikes that still had tags on them, um, would then get impounded. Um, but, uh, signing the racks allows us to, to put these signs out before students head home, 
um, so that they're more aware of, of what's going on. Um, and uh, then we can kind of quickly come in right after commencement uh, and begin removing bikes, um, which you know, reduces the, the number of bikes that end up um, getting stolen because, um, because so thieves think that they're abandoned. Um, uh, and also you can see on the sign that we've, uh, we include information about our, our bike storage option, which is something that we've added in the past few years. Um, and uh, we've seen grow over the years as well. Um, we price that uh, in a way that uh, so it's, it's less than what it costs to retrieve your bike from impoundment. Um, and we kind of stress that to people, you know, like this is, this is the easy way. We try to give them as many options um, as we can. <clears throat> and so just uh, some of the results of, of that, um, as I said, Prior to the, the pandemic, we were averaging 240 bikes um, uh, that were impounded every year. And, and um, this past year, uh, it was just 112. Um, so a 53% reduction, um, which is great. And, and hoping to, to see that continue to, to go down uh, this year. Um, the, the 2021 number, I, I just kind of disregard because we had, um, let's see, probably uh, 70% of, of uh, classes were entirely virtual. Um, and then another probably 25 were, were kind of hybrid. So we just had a lot, uh, a lot fewer people on campus, a lot less bike activity. Um, so it's hard to really draw any conclusions from that. But um, that's really all I had to present on. Uh, here's my contact information if you wanna reach out to me outside of um, today's presentation, but um, looking forward to the discussion. just have to give kudos to all three of you for how timely those presentations were. <laughs> so I think the idea now is to open it up. Jeff, do you have a sort of plan for this? Yeah, I think kind of what we wanted to do is kind of model this a really similar to kind of how we do our regular Thursday calls where, you know, like right now the topic is abandoned bikes and I think we're happy to kind of workshop it and talk with anyone if there's questions. I see a lot of familiar faces here. I'll call out like Janet Walker, John Schrader. I think these are folks that it's so nice to kind of see regular faces. John Mark Lucas, so nice to hang out with you. Um, there's a lot more names. Sorry, I'm just kind of pulling up the ones that are, are jumping to my eyes. Um, but yeah, I think there's a question in the chat uh, about kind of like, you know, what are the other benefits? Um, I was typing something up, but I can kind of get into it. You know, at UC Davis, the uh, bike registration goes into support uh, offering other services to people as well. So anytime someone gets uh, their lock cut because they lost their key, the bike lock became rusted, um, you know, we will go out and cut that lock. That's a service that the bike registration goes to, to pain. Um, we are, again, a self-funded entity. So, you know, that $12 fee, it's a, such a small little amount of money that goes to supporting the programming that we do. Um, but until we're either much more fiscally flush, which we are not due to the pandemic, um, but, uh, you know, until we're a little bit better, I, I'd love to make it free. I'd love to make it cheaper. Um, historically, 12 is what we have been doing. Um, it, it, what, it used to be basically 18 because there was a renewal. So I've made it like half the cost or 50%. Uh, math is not my strongest thing. Um, but yeah, it offers access to our storage. It offers lock cuts. And anytime we do valet services, it lets people have access to that. And again, that's because of that trail of ownership. Um, I won't touch a bike. I cannot verify who it belongs to. Um, you know, that for us is a really big bugaboo. I don't want to be uh, touching any stolen property. So, and again, we check that. So if the bike enters our possession, we have them write down their email, we scan the registration sticker, we make sure it's with the right person. If it's not, we're like, hey, what's going on? And we try our best to kind of get it back to the right, right folks. Um, anyone else kind of can talk why your registration program is so important? What does it offer? I, I can comment, someone asked in the chat about what our registration rate was before and after um, it was required. So we used to, our bike program used, used to manage bike registration at Stanford and we charged a fee, a modest $5 fee. We registered everyone's bike during the first day of new student orientation and gave away a really cool Stanford branded bike light, which was the 
the coolest thing to have if you registered your bike. Then fast forward three years ago, we transitioned the program to public safety and we transitioned from managing all those records, transferred them to public safety, and now we use the platform um, Project 529. So over the last three years, when we registered bikes uh, as a department, we were at like 85, 88%, and it's dropped down quite um, less than half of that now are our bikes being registered, but it's just gonna take time to scale up the program because it's being managed by a different department. And then Stanford Public Safety, they do amazing things. They sell abandoned bikes that aren't claimed um, after the time period for $30. And they also have a program where if your bike is stolen, they'll let, they'll, they'll let you select a bike from the abandoned bike yard for free too. So that's a pretty cool perk as well. I do think we have folks on people to unmute. So if there's like questions coming up, people want to ask other questions of bike folks. I think that's um, uh, a thing. Um, there is a question uh, Matthew has here says, noticed a theme that impounded bikes are often or eventually sold. Has there been a risk liability concern about distributing bikes that may or may not be in the best state of repair? And how is that managed? You know, for us, we, when we put them out to our auction partner, we have a very kind of detailed waiver in our thing saying these bikes are being sold as is, whereas they are abandoned property. No guarantee of completeness or condition is offered. Um, we, we have had folks kind of reject the bike when they come to pick it up, and that's fine. We refund them the purchase price. Our auctions start at $5, and a lot of them go for $5. Um, so it's not a huge amount of like a bug, like not a huge amount of loss for us if we have to turn that money back around. Um, but yeah, no, we we've had that um, checked with our campus legal, um, and so yeah, we're we're pretty comfortable with that. And any bikes that are donated are done through uh, kind of external partners um, or through our campus bike shop where they do the bike repair. Um, so the that kind of liability is moved along to other stuff, other staff, other entities, not staff. Um, Patrick has a question here. So are you doing anything with your, um, any local bike co-ops or you're donating these bikes to, uh, to these co-ops for, you know, lower income community members or anything like that? I, I can address that. Um, at Stanford, I know Stanford Public Safety has about five charities um, that they donate bikes to on a regular basis, and that includes, you know, serving uh, underserved populations, Goodwill, Catholic Charities, um, a, a pretty robust list, so they do give back. And they, they are you know, they are sold the $30 price. The bikes are sold as is. So um, that's pretty clear. I think they have to sign a waiver that they're accepting the bike in that condition. And then there was a question in the chat about what classes do you offer? And we have a pretty robust um, series of, of on in-person events on how to maintain a bike, how to repair a bike, um, you know, how to share the road, how to be a respectful rider. And um, I can share the link um, in the follow-up too on our bike webinars that we've recorded. And then we're just gearing up now for spring with new classes. Thanks. For us, once um, we have possession of a, of a bicycle, it becomes university property and, and then it's kind of subject to our, our policy on, on surplus property. Um, and so what, what we do is we just provide students with the information with, with places where they can donate their bike if that's what they want to do. Um, and um, just, just hope that they have a way to, to get it um, to those different organizations. Yeah, for us, once it becomes donation eligible, we kind of we we wait until we have kind of a critical mass and then reach out to various local partners and we let them come and pick and pull 
of the abandoned uh, of the donation eligible bikes. Um, we put a special tag on it if they're past at auction. Um, and we probably do that like three or four times a year with four different bike co-ops, um, you know, bike advocacy groups who do bike repair and donation to folks. Um, yeah, we partner a lot with the Sacramento area bike advocates to kind of come in and select the bikes. And then they have their own bike pairing program that they kind of distribute those bikes through. Um, our city of Davis bike co-op is kind of constantly inundated with bikes. We kind of have a bike problem here in Davis. Um, so I, I, while they're available to, I, they haven't picked me up, up on coming and pulling from our inventory yet. So Jeff, you said donation eligible. How do you determine, um, or how do, how do you, yeah, figure out what's donation eligible and what isn't? So the donation eligible kind of is a, um, either when the bike is impounded and we can tra track who the owner is, they can donate it to our program. Um, so that's a, hey, your bike has been impounded. Would you like it? Or would you like to donate it? Bikes that are donated are really easy for us to handle um, because we can, it, it, we can really do whatever we want with them. Um, we can put those bikes out underneath people if they're in good repair. We can sell them if we want to fundraise for that. Um, the other way that bikes become donation eligible is that they're passed at auction. And so this is enshrined in kind of California law as we are a state entity. Um, bikes, uh, abandoned property has to be held for 90 days, then put up to auction. If not sold at public auction, it couldn't be donated or destroyed. Um, and kind of pulling back that comment, they used to throw away some eight tons of bikes a year because they were not sold at auction. Um, we have a lot of kind of trashy bike that floats up to the surface. Yeah, I think one thing I'd be interested in, in hearing from others about is um, we have our, um, the, the person who manages surplus property on, on campus is, is sort of a, a gatekeeper and, and kind of, um, um, <laughs> He, he, he sets the rules on what happens with the bikes in some sense. I mean, I've read through the policy and it's not quite clear um, that, that we have to, that once we, we have possession of the bikes that they are university property, um, but that's his interpretation. Um, and so I, I, I'd be interested in hearing how, um, what kind of progress other people have, have made, um, assuming that, that they kind of have a similar process um, where they have monthly auctions of surplus property, but um, what you've been able to do to, to maybe um, take control of those of those bikes and, and see that they are put back um, into the hands of people who need them. Oh, I have nothing. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, you know, like uh, in the dwell of silence, I'll talk about a program that, you know, I've recently had to suspend just due to bandwidth, but I'm looking to kind of get it back through our, one of our bike, our on-campus bike shop, but it's to have students come, students who go into our basic needs center, um, who kind of are always, are evaluated kind of in a holistic way of like, what are your needs, like, where are you not getting your basic needs, you know, food, housing, transportation. Transportation is part of the ecosystem of a basic need. It's part of housing in a very kind of core land use sense. Um, so our basic need center does, can, they're trying to get transportation added into the things that they have to address. In the intern, um, we were doing this a little bit in 2021, where they were identifying students who had that transportation need that a bike could fit. And then they would refer that student to my program where I would identify these bikes after they had been repaired through a local grant that we got, um, or that we didn't get, but a local advocacy group had gotten it from the air quality district. Um, so I was kind of like the matchmaker and the broker, but the actual bike was assembled and taken care of by an external entity. Um, you know, that was a really cool program. We're kind of, um, we've had to suspend it as that grant only fixed some 50 bikes um, in cost. And so we're exhausted the grant money. Um, I am trying to kind of work with our campus bike shop to figure out if they can do in-kind donation of their labor hours um, to get those bikes in good repair uh, so that we can then have them be kind of the arbiter, and the broker for those things. Um, because yeah, it's, it turns out there's an incredible need for it. Um, and um, while my student staff is capable, they're not bike repair people, uh, they're bike trash managers. 
uh, and um, yes, yeah, so they're really good at waste management, but they're they yeah they're not great at putting bikes together safely. They can make a bike complete. They've gotten really good at that of taking bikes out of the wheel pile and putting them on a frame so it goes to auction complete. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to ask for them to make a bike safe for someone. They're not trained for that. I, I can share a story. We held a bike repair class 101 uh, last week and we had about 40 people come. Most of them were students because they want to learn how to repair their bike. And I just, I was astounded at the condition of the bikes these students were riding, you know, tires not inflated and brake cables not engaged and quick releases not hooked up properly. And it's just, it, it's so important that the Stanford Bicycle Project, you know, a student-led group is trying to encourage people to learn how to repair bikes and maintain bikes. Um, it's a labor of love and really time consuming to learn, but that's a key component of teaching people. You know, we want them to ride, but we want them to ride safely and to ride a safe bike. So our hope is the Stanford Bicycle Project will expand. You know, I'm, I, you think of Stanford and you think of people being very wealthy, but we have many underserved uh, low-income students attending that, you know, at New Student Orientation, they couldn't afford to buy a bike. And so the programs where they could opt to get a bike uh, for free or, you know, get a bike at a low cost is really imperative um, in the equity scenario so that that they can ride and enjoy and have fun and get around and, and be mobile on the campus. Yeah, I wanna add, well, you know, our campus has the ASUCD Bike Barn, you know, they're an important resource in our education programming. So I, I do partner with them in a lot of these things about basic bike repair. Um, but yeah, we kind of have like a big funny separation in a lot of ways or like, I work with them as much as I can, but everyone goes there for bike repair education. Um, and so they're, they're kind of our golden resource on our campus that really supports us with a lot of this. And uh, yeah, the earn a bike program is something I, I'm trying to kind of build back the capacity to do. Um, I was wondering, do you do bike indexing for staff and faculty or is it mostly focused just on the students? And like, do you do like stuff with HR or anything or like that? all affiliates for us. It's everyone yeah. on our campus. I'll note, that, mm -hmm. I'll note that UC Davis is a platinum level bicycle friendly business and bicycle friendly university, thinking about both of those audiences. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I forget have, to gloat about I have that a, sometimes. Um, <laughs> I have a question that uh, comes up sometimes for people trying to start new abandoned bike abatement programs, especially at state schools. And I remember this being a challenge when I was in this role. Uh, and your your programs are all old enough that that maybe this question has, was answered so long ago. But um, similar to the liability question, some state schools have a lot of really strict restrictions on holding on to property for a certain period of time. And um, you know, it's true with a found computer. It's true with you know any property that is found on the campus. It's you know there are concerns about giving it away too quickly. And so there are, you know, 90 day periods, 60 day periods, you know, it varies from school to school. Um, and so I, I have heard from some schools that struggle to set up programs where they can do things like auctions or, or other things because of the, those kinds of um, sort of legality restrictions um, from the school's uh, perspective. And especially again, if it's a state school with state level laws that they're butting up against. Do any of you recall how those uh, issues were dealt with at your school? So I know that for us, this um, my understanding is that we set the, the um, this sort of like holding period. Um, ours is 120 days, which is really long. I'd like to get it down to 90. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's in our, our, um, the, the, parking um, manual. Um, so uh, it, it's it's not included in any uh, university policies. You know, our, I, all right, you go first. On our, on our campus, it's, um, we're, we're technically 
a, a city, Stanford, but we're on the, under the jurisdiction of Santa Clara County. So we have to follow the Santa Clara County traffic code and that 90 day hold is pretty strict. And we thought about approaching them to ask if it could be reduced, but we haven't made much progress or traction on reducing that time frame. Yeah, I'll, you know, the program at Davis has been here for 40 years now, and I'm just the lucky person who gets to run it these days. Uh, but one thing I'm kind of, uh, you know, to talk about that, you know, our campus council is the resource who kind of helps us verify if we can or cannot do something. Um, so I actually went to campus council after I thoroughly read state law with a question, because so many of the bikes that we get do not sell for over $250. California law says they can only, we only need to hold bikes or things of value less than $250 for 30 days. I haven't made this into action yet. I have that as a decision from our campus council, though, is that yes, because the proven sale price of most bikes is less than $250, unless it's assumed that that bike will sell for more than $250, I only have to hold on to them for 30 days. I'm still doing 90 because a lot of folks can't get their life together in 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of folks who miss their appointment, miss their appointment, miss their appointment, and then we're like, your bike's up to auction, and then all of a sudden they come and pick it up. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I think that's really the comment I'd say is review relevant law and talk to your lawyers. Everyone's got to eat. Yeah, I think for yeah, us, sort of a follow up. Oh, um, just the, the reason why, um, ours is set so long is, is because most of our, our bikes are impounded over the summer and we want to make sure when students come back in the fall, that the bikes are still there. They have an opportunity to, um, to co um, collect their their bike uh, before it's auctioned off. So there's got to be a better way to to do it though. Maybe it's not a maybe it's not stating the number of days, but giving a sort of time of the of the year or something. I don't know. I don't know. Real fast, Anna said, "I want to go to bike Davis to go bike shopping." You don't have to. You can shop online. And if you need to get it shipped, I know some folks locally who might be willing to go pick that bike up and help you out. We as a campus do not offer that service. You have to hire a courier or a friend. Deborah, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Oh, I'm glad you put that uh, prompt up there because I couldn't get it off from you. I am having so much problems with my phone. And I just wanted to see if uh, the speakers could put their information and contact information in chat again. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I have another follow up question somewhat related to the, um, you know, thinking about a 90 day period. Um, you need a lot of storage space for that many abandoned bikes for that long a period. What were the challenges and solutions you all found to, you know, make the case for that kind of storage space on your campus uh, and, you know, using using space in that way when, you know, we all know real estate is <laughs> quite pricey on many of these campuses and uh, competitive in how you use it. Um, yeah, that's such a great question. Yeah. Um, at Stanford, space is so valuable. And right now, the property that's used for holding the bikes is in the jurisdiction of where public safety is, but there's never enough room. And because of regulations with the county, we can't just find a place and say we want to store abandoned bikes. It has to go through a, a pretty labor intensive process to get it regulated for temporary storage. So I would say that's, that's a challenge. In the past, I know they got trailers to store bikes in off property, but um, because of liability, that is no longer happening. So. It just seems like there's a lot of rules and regulations on the back end side that present so many challenges. For us, For us I, we actually um, store our, our bikes in a um, 
an old chicken coop um, and, and <laughs> half of the coop is still used. So um, it smells really great in the summer. Um, <laughs> and it's um, anyway, it happens to, to be located in sort on kind of on the edge of, of campus in an area um, where we don't really have to worry, you know, about students maybe tampering um, uh, with the, the location. I mean, it's, it's locked and everything already, but um, yeah, we, we, um, and we have a little bit of overflow space in, in one of the garages, um, should we need to use it, but um, to date we haven't had that problem. Yeah, we have the belly of our parking garage that's our main storage area. Um, I do have a, a kind of caged in area out near our campus airport where we also put bikes. Um, we try to not put anything aside from like true bones and, and kind of bicycle shaped objects out there though, because we have huge theft problems. Uh, we have procured some shipping containers that we're placing out there to store the bikes inside of. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I kind of worry about that in the hot, hot summer that we get out here. I think it's going to melt all the bikes, but we'll see. One Jamie. thing that I see, Jamie has got your hand. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I can. Um, I can chime in a little bit. I was just going to mention that, um, you know, one of the things. It, some of this work. I, I work for Colorado State University, and some of the work that was done on on what I'm going to mention was done before I started working here. So I, I can't tell you all the ins and outs about how they made it happen. But our storage space issue, especially for our bike impound, was one of the reasons that we actually rewrote our policy about how long we have to hold the bikes, um, and then reduced it to 25 days. Um, before we could release it to surplus property, which then, you know, could then fix the bikes up and sell them. Um, so that was a, a, a huge issue because our, our impound lot at the, it's our, actually our police department that does the, the impounds and um, the bike registration fees go to help pay for the people who do that work. Um, but it's a, um, it, you know, that was one of the big justifications for being able to to reduce the amount of time that we had to hold on to things or that, that police has to hold on to things. And then also the justification for some programs that our central receiving department put in place to actually hold bikes, store bikes for the summer or winter breaks. So they actually charge a fee to store people's bikes so that they don't end up abandoned. Um, and then they, they do this um, pretty cool program that they, they put into place, I think two years ago, where, um, you know, you, when the students are leaving for the summer or winter breaks, then central receiving comes out with these huge containers and receives the bikes and then, you know, checks them in and they offer, um, to store it as well as do a tune up when they come and get it back when they come for the next semester so that it's ready to go for them. So those things are, um, just some things that are trying to prevent the abandoned piece, uh, to begin with, because, you know, the, it's a continual issue, um, obviously for all of us, but how do we prevent it, the bikes from being abandoned to begin with? So, um, and then we also do communicate on our bike racks that, hey, if you leave your bike here for, you know, we have signs like permanent signs that say, if you leave your bike here, um, it can be impounded to try to encourage people to, to ride them because we know that bikes that sit there are more likely to get stolen as well. And it attracts the, the thieves. Um, and, and so that's a, another reason that we try to encourage that. And one other plug for making sure you have a bike registration program and stickers of, that are visible, we actually find that that helps prevent theft. Um, you know, or if, if uh, they might gloss over one that doesn't have the sticker and steal the one that, that does, that's next to it, or does, yeah, or gloss over the one that does have the sticker and steal the one that doesn't. So that's been, um, you know, a good theft prevention uh, technique for us as well. So I just thought I'd mention that. That's great information. Thanks, um, I wanted to share too that our data shows that uh, the most amount of abandoned bikes are left towards the end of the year during student move out. And so kudos to the Stanford Bicycle Project. They are setting up a really easy system where students can just ping a QR code and they'll deliver a ticket for their bike and they can leave it at the front desk and then people will pick up the bike and take it away rather than just leave it in a rack and then the, 
you know, if every student does that, we have hundreds of bikes that are unattended. Um, and I think they're trying to work to get funding to give them some kind of incentive for doing that. But at least the process is in place and they'll be testing it, um, you know, this uh, move out uh, to see if it, you know, impacts the number of bikes left behind. John. John asked a really interesting question, and I don't think we've talked about, but our storage fees, um, you know, that $10 impound release fee is a flat fee for us right now. Uh, it kind of is low at so to incentivize people removing their bikes from our, our impound lot. Um, we are exploring how to pair that to our storage fee because we have a $12 a month, $10 a month bicycle storage fee for any of our storage options. So if we're doing summer storage, um, if we're doing bike lockers or our secure bike cage we have on campus, those are all the same price. Um, but if you leave your bike at the dorm, we cut your lock and we hold on to it for the summer, you just got a $10 bike storage for three and a half months. Where's the incentive? So I'm I'm reviewing this with our, our kind of finance and business team right now to say it's $10 per month of storage. It's a $10 release fee period and $10 per month of storage. And so if you get it within the first 30 days, it's just the impound fee. But on the 31st day, it becomes $20. On the 61st day, it becomes 60 or uh, four, four. Yeah, and so on and so on. Um, I'm really bad at math today. I'm sorry, everybody. We charge um, $20 um, for, for summer bike storage. We have, we have yet to kind of provide an option, um, I guess just a, a monthly option or even something during the winter break. Um, although that's been kind of, that idea has been kicked around a lot because, um, you know, winters can be kind of brutal and, and our, our bike workshop space on campus sees a lot of um, traffic the, the first couple of weeks of the spring semester because students are, are tending to their bikes that, um, you know, usually have rusted chains and whatnot from being left out over the winter break. We have a privately owned bike shop on campus called the Campus Bike Shop, and they do offer summer storage for students. Um, they charge um, a monthly fee or, you know, summer returning in fall. Uh, fee and then they can add on you know they'll tune up the bike and have it ready when students come back to class which is a nice benefit I put the link in the chat too This is a yeah. great question from Janet. Do you find your students, faculty, and staff want covered bike parking and or secure bike parking? Um, yes, yes, and yes. Um, we do <laughs> offer bike cages for commuters, but we, unfortunately, because of space demand, we can't offer covered, secured storage in our bike cages uh, to students just because there's so many students. And so most of our bike racks are outside. We have pretty nice weather. Um, on, uh, at Stanford, so the elements don't affect um, uncovered parking, but um, yes, uh, we, we transitioned from enclosed bike lockers um, because of land use and space and efficiency, and now are expanding our bike cage offerings and building more of those, but they accommodate um, our student, our, our commuting uh, uh, population, not students. Does that include commuting students or just commuting faculty staff? No, if they're a commuting student, if they live off campus and ride to work, um, they can they can rent a space. It's a modest six dollars per month. It's an enclosed space that will have video surveillance soon, and then they use their Stanford ID to access the cages. Great, great. Is it in a parking deck? Where is it? Most How'd of them are do? located on the main floor of our, of our parking garage. 
We're starting to build a few more cages um, that are outside in key areas. Um, and we're planning, you know, an additional three cages in the next year because of the demand. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Thank you. Well, so we've got one minute left. I want to see if any of our speakers have anything, closing remarks you all want to say. I'll just comment. I love this group. I love sharing information. I think I've learned an amazing amount just from hearing your questions and your comments today. So I hope you can join um, the campus group on Thursday and uh, continue this discussion. Yeah, I think you said it pretty well. Um, I um, yeah, I I would ag agree completely. I mean, it's always great to to get together and learn from others. Um, anyway, there's I always pick up something from the from these calls. So um, um, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I'll I'll kind of finish out of from our panel, but yeah, thank you so much to Amelia and Anna and what y'all do at Bicycle Friendly America. You know, I think. Uh, UC Davis is so lucky to be distinguished as both a BFU and a BFB. Y'all have been immensely helpful in kind of making sure that, you know, that support brings others up too. Um, so, and, you know, like what we're talking about today is just one thing that the campuses have to deal with, but it's a sticky, gross monster that is out there. So even if you're a, a, any kind of affiliate, you know, abandoned bikes are a thing. And I think we could all do a lot better to try to address it. Um, and I, I just really appreciate, you know, having this time to share with everybody. It's been great. Thank you.